and I'm so pleased to be able to host this event for the um, East Hampton Arts Council. Carol and her panel are going to give you some really important information. So let's all get our notepads and pens out and learn some good stuff. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well. Thanks so much to you for hosting this. She's hosted a lot of really great events here. We really appreciate it. And I'm very grateful to these rock star panelists for coming. We have an amazing panel here. Um, and thank you for coming. This is professional development, and it's not the kind of thing that's the most fun on Sunday afternoon when it's a beautiful day, but it's a great thing to do. So hopefully you'll learn something that helps you. Um, the reason I wanted to do this topic is I, over the years, have heard from artists and actually dealers, issues with artists, um, about what happens when they show work in a gallery or they just ex ex exhibit work. Um, a few, like maybe 20 years ago, I bought a drawing from a dealer from a gallery in Manhattan and I went to his next show and said, I bought this drawing from you, I really love it. And he said, I didn't know that sold. Here he is in the gallery where the, uh, and then a couple of years later, somebody came to me who's a photographer who said, I know that I sold a photograph because the dealer asked me to print it and I haven't gotten paid. Uh, so I told her about this law. And recently there's an example where someone whose name will remain nameless has about 15 paintings who, that have been, that are in the custody of a, a dealer out here. Um, I'm not going to mention any names. Um, certainly not people here and not the very nice dealers that we know, but she asked for paintings back. She wanted to know where they were, and he said, oh, I probably, I gave them back to you. You probably forgot I gave them back to you, and she pressed, and with a little help, she wrote some emails, some kind of friendly emails. He, he ignored them. Uh, a letter was written, a lawyer's letter, you know, you're violating the, the law, it's most clear. Uh, but the response to that was actually a bankruptcy lawyer who called and said, she must have forgotten, and anyway, she has to prove all this stuff, which neither one is true. So it's, it's kind of unfortunate. We also have lovely dealers out here. Um, first time I dealt with Catherine, Catherine Markell, I went into her gallery, I liked a painting, and she didn't even know me. She said, here, take it home and try it. So, and the dealers who are here are certainly very respected. And, um, and I've also heard from dealer clients of issues with artists who will hear about some of the things that come up if artists sell paintings that dealers have promoted and don't pay the deal, we don't give the share of the commission or insurance issues or we'll hear about some of the problems that dealers have on the other side. So um, this is what we're going to do. Two lawyers, two artists, two dealers. Uh, I'm going to talk about a law that protects an artist in a gallery um, under certain conditions without a contract at all. But it's a law that's really important for people to know about because it is a great protection and it's simple. Most law is not simple. You know, we talk to you about stuff and it's like, oh, it hurt, makes your head hurt. This one is not complicated. And Judith Bressler, who is uh, the esteemed art lawyer who co-authored um, the, the treatise on art law, you can read all about all, everyone's credentials in here, is going to talk about what should go in your contract. And then we're going to hear from artists Molly Duganis, John Hobrick, and um, Arlene Bouges and Esperanza Leon about best practices and things that could help you. It's, we're going we're gonna to end at 6.30. We'll have questions at the end, so hold your questions and um, get you out of here in time. You can still go to the beach or do something fun. So um, here's the situation. What are your rights when you take a work to a dealer, if any? So here's an example. You meet a friend who tells you how much she loves your painting, which she bought at XYZ Gallery in New York City. Uh, this, you had no idea your painting was sold. Um, you don't have a contract with the gallery. You call the gallery and the gallery says, well, you show at your own risk. I don't know, I don't know, or whatever. Very evasive. Do you have any rights? Because um, often artists are told, well, you show at your own risk, go away. So there, there is a law that is called a consignment statute in New York, and many, many states have them, but this law, which has actually been improved, but it's been around for quite a while, which applies to transactions in New York when an artist or a craftsperson or, a, or an, an heir of an artist, well, let's just say when an artist 
for now, delivers work to what's called an art merchant. So when you take your work to a dealer, there's an automatic protection that says the proceeds of the sales and the work are considered trust property. That means the dealer has to take care of it, special care. Like you take, your, you take your dress to a dry cleaner, it gets ruined and the dry cleaner says, sorry. So you could sue the dry cleaner or whatever, but it's really hard to do. This law makes it really easier for you to get protection from this dealer. Um, the dealer is not supposed to commingle your funds with their own funds. They aren't supposed to pay the lighting bill or the you know, printing bill or anything. The money's supposed to be separate. But this law that existed, which sounds really good, could be waived. W-A-I-V-E, that means you can sign your rights away. We're going to hold questions to the end, but if we use, lawyers tend to speak a foreign language. If we use words that you don't know, just ask. But waive means give up. So if an artist can waive something, often they have to, because their bargaining power isn't always as good as the dealer. I mean, a dealer that would say waive the protections under this statute, I would not want to probably deal with anyway, because why would they say, I don't have to take care of your works. Please sign this. But it happens. And then sometimes people sign things that when they don't know what it says, it's a bunch of legal words and they sign. So um, there was a problem with this law. There was no way to enforce it. There were no real, pe real penalties if the galleries actually did use the money for other things. Um, art, often they had to waive their rights and it was very costly to bring a lawsuit. So you may remember, I don't know how long ago this was, five, 10 years ago, there was a dealer on the Upper East Side, Lawrence Salander, who went to jail uh, because he actually you know, ripped off a lot of artists and artists' estates. He had a, a large gallery. He, he didn't like modern art. He was outraged that Warhols were selling for as much as Rembrandt's, and he was going to solve the problem by selling old masters. So he sold them many times over to the same person is basically what he did. And he's now in jail. Um, uh, I guess it was $88 million that he defrauded people of. Um, he, when the Mat Manhattan DA described his crime, he just said, why sell it once when you can sell it three times? So he would sell 50% of a, of a painting to John McEnroe, and he would sell that 50% three more times, and you know, four times 50 is, you, you can't sell a painting. You can't sell half a painting four times. So people tried to get their money back, their paintings back. Stuart Davis' son tried to get money from the Stuart Davis paintings that were sold, but the money was gone. He filed bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is not supposed to be able to touch artist paintings or artist assets, but somehow, lots of you know lawyers, you know have a law, you know fancy lawyers, made it possible that none of this that this law didn't really work. So this law was strengthened. Um, but what happened is all the money these, that are supposed to be held in trust was gone. So what are the artists supposed to do? I, you know, you, you're, you're supposed to hold my money in trust, but if you don't have it, what are they supposed to do? Um, and even though there is this law that says they can't do that, there were lots of fancy arguments made and nobody got m any money out of it. So we're all on a committee, an art law committee of the city bar, and we do a lot of really good things for artists. And we do a lot of good things. So we got this law strengthened. So now, the law, this is what the law says. And you don't have to remember all the details, but remember the concept. Um, that when you bring artwork, an artist, a craftsperson, or their heir to a dealer, it is trust property. They have to take care of it. They have a special duty to take care of it. It can't be used to pay their bills. It can't even become part of a bankruptcy estate. People file for bankruptcy to try to avoid their bills, which they couldn't happen. But by law now, it cannot happen. The law cannot be waived. Even if you are forced to sign something, it's not valid. So you cannot waive your rights under that law. And anybody that asks you to do that, I don't think it's not somebody you want to deal with. It just emphasizes your proceeds have to be kept separate. And if there's a violation, it can be a misdemeanor. There could be criminal penalties for it. Um, you can bring a lawsuit on your own. There's, so the law provides for that. And you, if you're successful, you as the artist can get your attorney's fees paid. Because it's very expensive. Litigation is very expensive. A lot, a lot of work. It's, it's not glamorous. It's so, it's really good, good law. So that's the thing to remember. And the term, which I always tell students to use this term, you have a fiduciary obligation to the artist. And that's a legal word. It's a Latin word. But it means a high level of obligation, trust, etc. And for example, when this, this uh, lawyer for this dealer who 
got this notice saying he kept all his artist's work. He said, well, she probably forgot, and also she has to prove it. She has to really, really, really prove it. But this law says the burden of proof, which means who has the, who has the tougher job to do in court, shifts to the dealer. But you have, the artist has to prove they delivered the work, which a lot of people are going to talk about how to prove that, which is really important. And make a demand, which clearly was done in his case. And then the, this dealer, defendant, bank robber, whatever you want to call them, has to prove defenses. So what that lawyer said was just wrong. So there's a, a, law, a strong law that protects. Fiduciary obligation, if you remember that word, that's a good word to use. And if you throw that around, you know, somebody's going to pay attention. And what that means is you have to act in good faith. You have to keep the money separate. You have to act on behalf of the artist, not on behalf of yourself. So um, that word is often used in estates when you talk about a, a somebody who has to take care of an estate. They have to take good care. It's, it's not just show at your own risk. So this law is really useful to know about. Uh, as I say, you don't have to have a contract to have that protection. Um, but Judith is going to talk about it's a really good idea to have a contract so you have things written down and you can prove that you delivered the work and uh, other things. So Judith is going to talk about, let me show you out of here. Wrestler Esquire. Very, oh, yeah. Thank you, Miss okay. Esquire. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Carol. So, as we learned from Carol, in the absence of an outright sale, where the dealer buys a work from the artist and the artist is paid in full for that work, the relationship between the artist and the dealer is one of consignment where the dealer is the artist's agent and also a fiduciary of the artist, must only act, as Carol said, in the artist's best interest and forego all personal gain except payment for services. And while the consignment statute does provide a baseline of protection for the artist, it really does not provide protection for either the artist or the dealer who might want to enforce certain aspects of the relationship, such as how often does the artist get paid, or the degree of artistic control that an artist might have over the hanging of her work. And so it really is important to have a written agreement. And I must tell you that the larger dealers that I have dealt with, um, Swerner, Pace, Gagosian, invariably memorialize their relationship with their stable of artists in writing. So given that, what do we put in a representation agreement? <clears throat> First of all, of course, obviously, you put a description of the art that you are consigning. Now, occasionally, an artist will work in vastly diverse media. For example, an, an artist might paint in oils and also do some video art. And so on occasion, not often, but on occasion, an artist might have a different dealer to represent the artist for video art and might have a different dealer to represent the artist for acrylics and oils. So you describe the art that you are consigning. Then you want to have a territory of consignment. What territory is covered by the dealer? Is it the United States? Is it the Northeast? Is it the world? You always specify a territory. How long is the relationship going to last? What is the term of representation? Is it two years, three years, four years? Now, it is to the artist's advantage to have a flat term whether it's two years, three years, or four years, with the dealer being required to return the artwork to the artist after the term is over, unless they agree to renew the term. It is to the dealer's advantage to have automatic renewals. So for example, 
a two-year term or a four-year term with automatic renewals of a year each continuing unless ended by either party, say, 60 days prior to the close of the then ter current term. So you really want to be straight about what is the term of representation. Exclusivity. If the dealer is going to be the exclusive agent for the artist, then it should be in a signed contract providing that the dealer will engage best efforts to sell and promote the artist's work. And this is also in the Uniform Commercial Code, Article 2306. If there is an exclusive seller of goods, that seller, unless agree to the contrary, has to engage their best efforts. And it makes perfect sense because the artist, if it's an exclusive dealer, is dependent upon that dealer to promote and sell the artist's work. Now, this is a goodie for the dealer. In a written agreement, the dealer should request the right to buy outright at net price at the beginning of the term three or four paintings of the artist because artists often change dealers and the dealer should have a few works of the artist on inventory to sell. So this should be in the agreement. They can sell them even after the artist changes dealers. Okay, now, what about studio sales? If the artist sells work from her studio, does the dealer get a commission? And if so, is it a reduced commission? Because after all, the dealer isn't promoting that particular work, even though the dealer is promoting the artist's work and trying to make a market for the artist. And what about bartering? Let's say the artist has absolutely terrible teeth, and the artist goes to the dentist, and the dentist says, geez, I'm going to have to do a lot of bridge work for you. And the artist says, well, I don't really have the money to pay you. And the dentist said, that's OK. I am an admirer of your art. So why don't you give me a painting in exchange for the dental work that I'm going to do? The artist says, terrific. Well, does the dealer get a commission on that? And if so, is it a reduced commission? And what about sales to friends? Um, and what about giving gifts to family? Should the dealer put a limit on that? And the answer is yes. You know why? because there is a limited universe out there. The artist can't sell herself. There is only a limited number of people who are going to buy an artist's work. And if the artist has the unlimited right to sell her works, then she is undermining what the dealer is trying to do for her, that is to create a market for her works. So in my practice, when I would negotiate with Pace for a particular artist that I represent, I agree that there has to be a limit to the number of works that the artist herself or himself can sell. Selling prices, again, should be in the agreement. Who determines the sale price for the art? Usually, it's both parties. And what about discounts? Now, we know that a dealer for an artist does more than sell an artist's work. A dealer is a market maker for an artist. And in view of that, there are certain classes of buyers that, from the artist and the dealer's perspective, are more desirable than others. Who are these buyers? These are buyers who are in a position to promote the artist's work, like architects, interior designers, museums, maybe some very famous collectors. So the dealer ordinarily will give these people who buy a work a discount. The discount should be anywhere between 10 and 20 percent. If the dealer, though, offers one of these people a 50 percent discount, shouldn't do it because that is a breach of the dealer's fiduciary duty to the artist. In addition, there should be in the agreement room for a periodic review of the artist's prices because hopefully the dealer is working to promote the artist. The artist's reputation should be enhanced over a period of showings 
and hopefully the artist prices will go up. And in any event, the art market fluctuates, so there should be provision to periodically review the artist's prices. Dealers' commissions. As we know, dealers will generally charge a commission anywhere, broad spectrum here, between 25 and 60 percent of the retail price. More commonly, it is between 33 and a third percent and 50 percent of the retail price. Now, certain dealers like Gagosian, for example, or Pace or Zwerner, who are very well wired into the art market, can command a higher commission because it is very easy for them to promote an artist's work. By the same token, very, very well-known artists, marquee names, can cause the dealer to charge a lower commission. So it truly is a negotiation, but within that framework. How is the commission computed? Well, two basic ways. You have net price and percentage of sale. With net price, the artist will name a price that must be given net to the artist on a particular work. When the dealer sells it for more, the dealer keeps the overage. So if an artist says, I must get $100,000 for this work, and the dealer sells it for $135,000, artist gets $100,000, the dealer keeps $35,000 as a commission. Far more common, however, is the percentage of sale where the dealer has a fixed percentage um, that the dealer imposes as a commission on the sales price. Now sometimes an artist will incur a fair amount of costs in creating a work. And if that's the case with a particular work, the artist should submit those costs to the dealer prior to setting a price for the work. So let's say an artist, just for an example, is working in alabaster and is making an alabaster sculpture. And, you know, it's expensive to make that. And let's say that the artist cost for the alabaster is $10,000. So the artist submits the $10,000 cost to the dealer. The artist and the dealer then set a sales price, let's say $100,000. When the work sells, the artist gets the $10,000 cost of production off the top prior to the dealer and the artist getting paid. So let's say the dealer has a 33 and a third percent commission. It sells for $100,000. The artist gets back $10,000. The dealer then gets one third of 90 or $30,000. And the artist gets $60,000. <coughs> Creating, shipping, and storage charges who pays for the costs of the artwork to be transported from the artist's studio to the dealer and stored? Well, again, that's a negotiation, and sometimes, depending on the artwork, sometimes these costs are shared. This is one the dealers don't like, but the artist should try for. <laughs> the dealer should furnish all buyers' names to the artist. The artist should know who his or her clients are, who likes her artwork. Um, maybe, telling you a little secret, maybe in this room one way an artist could do that is by telling her dealer, you know, I someday might want to create a catalog resume, a definitive text on all my work. So I really need to know the chain of title. I really need to know who owns my work, how it's exhibited, and in what literature it's included. But the artist should try and get the dealer to furnish the artist with the names of the buyers. In return, however, and this should also go in the agreement, and this is for the dealer, if the artist, in the course of his business, picks up some sales leads, people who are interested in buying the artist's works, the artist should immediately contact the dealer and give those names to the dealer. And these leads should then become the dealer's clients. And when they buy the work, the dealer should get a full commission. So it works both ways in terms of both parties really benefit from having an agreement. 
care of works. Well, clearly the dealer should provide, take good care of the works when they're in transport, when they're on display, and when they're in storage so as not to damage the works and, prepare and uh, preserve the artwork's condition. Insurance. The dealer pays for insurance to use an all-risk fine art policy. In the agreement, the time of coverage should be specified from the time it leaves an artist's studio to the time that it goes to the dealer and stays with the dealer and is either returned to the artist if unsold or delivered to a buyer. Also, the amount of coverage should be specified. At the very least, the dealer should cover the artwork for no less than 55 or 60 percent of the retail price. Not 100 percent, because the artist doesn't get 100 percent of the retail price. The artist gets part of the retail price and the dealer keeps the rest as a commission. However, you will on occasion have artists arguing that they should get, a, it should be insured for 100 percent of the retail price because in the event a work is lost or irretrievably damaged, it's a lost opportunity to sell. So this is a negotiation point between the artist and the dealer. Promotion. Well, this is the dealer's cost. This is basically what the artist is, what the dealer gets a commission on. So the dealer in the agreement should specify how many one person shows of the artist's work the dealer will have during the term. The dealer should indicate that um, they will use best efforts to include the artist's work in various group exhibitions, should get images of the artist's work and use it on all the dealer's literature and include it on the dealer's websites and in all media platforms. If the dealer is going to take works to art fairs, that also should be specified in the contract and the fair should be specified in the contract. And in connection with all of this, the dealer should get permission from the artist to use the artist's name, likeness, and bio for purposes of promoting the artwork. In addition, the dealer should in, engage themselves with museum curators to encourage museums to exhibit the artist's work. They should engage with art critics to get the artist to come and the critics to come and review the artist's work and engage with scholars to encourage scholars to write articles, or maybe even books about the artist's work. All this should be in writing in an agreement. And with the other galleries that I have worked with, it is. Sales tax. The dealer collects and pays the sales tax. Ideally, the dealer should also indemnify the artist against any liability um, for this kind of tax liability. Oh, 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 oh. Let's just leave it like this. All right, now we're doing another legal term, artist warranties. Okay. If you are a dealer, let's do it this way, if you are a dealer, what would you want the artist to represent to you about the work? Any thoughts? Well, you'd want to make sure that the artist will promise you that the work is original to the artist and that it doesn't infringe upon any personal or property rights of third people, third parties. Artist rights of accounting. The artist or the artist's representative should have the right to examine the dealer's books and records as they relate to the sale of the artist's work. The agreement should specify how often the artist or the artist's representative should examine the books and records. The agreement should also specify what kind of notice does the dealer need. Does the art, can the artist just pop in at any time or does the dealer need 10 days notice? This should all be in the agreement. The dealer should also provide the artist at regular intervals, that should be specified in the agreement, of money paid to the artist and money due the artist. And again, the dealer at specified intervals should furnish the artist with a statement of inventory. That statement of inventory should include all the details of the sales of the artist's work. The date of the sale, 
the sales price, ideally who bought the work. It should also list all the works that have not yet been sold and list where they are. Are they on display? Are they in storage? Where are they? So the artist knows where all of the works are. Termination. This is different from expiration. Expiration is when the term of representation runs out. <clears throat> Sometimes a representation agreement is terminated prior to the expiration of the term. When does that happen? <laughs> well, it happens upon the death of the artist, if the artist dies during the term, death or disablement of the artist. It happens um, for involuntary bankruptcy or dissolution on the part of the dealer. It can also happen if the artist fails to continue to produce work when the dealer is spending time and money promoting the artist's work. And that reminds me of something else. On occasion, a dealer will pay an artist a monthly advance against future expected sales. And that happens with some of the larger galleries. If a dealer does that, that should be tied to a requirement in the agreement that the artist has a certain output of work every three or four months. So if the dealer is paying the artist monthly advances, the artist has to produce and consign to the dealer X number of works of art. Now, in the event of a monthly advance, if at the end of the term, some of the works are not sold, and here you had the dealer paying these monthly advances to the artist, what happens? Well, there has to be a provision in the agreement that the, if it doesn't sell these works, say, within two years following the expiration of the agreement, the dealer gets to take title to these works for assuming the risk and for paying the monthly advances. After the term ends, we have to allow the dealer ample time to conclude the sale to all of the artist's work, to settle the artist's account, to pay any monies due and owing the artist, and of course, to return the works to the artist. As to the return of the art, shipping costs has to be determined who is going to pay the shipping costs. That's a point of negotiation. But if the dealer fails to return the art, and this happens, there should be in the agreement that if the artist has to sue the dealer to get the art back, the dealer will pay the artist's attorney's fees. And this will be a motivator <coughs> for the dealer to give the art back. Did you wrap up on that? Huh? Did you wrap up in a couple minutes, Dan? Yeah, I'm almost okay. done. Okay. <laughs> also, return of images and PR material. After the agreement is either terminated or expires, the dealer should return the images and the PR material to the artist. Why? because maybe the artist now will be working with another dealer and wants this material. However, if the dealer listened to me and at the outset bought a few works to sell on inventory, even after the agreement is ended, the dealer can make a copy of all the PR material that the dealer made um, and use it to promote the art that the dealer is still selling of the artist on inventory. Final, final slide, or whatever. And this is crucial. The agreement should provide that the artist-dealer relationship will be construed and governed in accordance with the laws of the state of New York regardless of any conflict of laws issues and that the parties to the agreement voluntarily submit themselves to the exclusive jurisdiction of the New York State Courts and the New York Federal Courts so they can benefit from the consignment statute that Carol told you about. Thank you. So now we're going to hear from 
a couple of artists and a couple of dealers. Let me just, um, let me Molly. just shut this all down and get it out of everybody's way. Thank you. Where would you be? Do you want to sit on a regular chair? No, I think I'd better stand. I'm afraid I'll fall. Okay. Can they hear me? I don't know. You have to ask them. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. okay uh, I've never gone into uh, as much detail when uh, 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 taking my work to a gallery, but that was very interesting. I wish I'd known a lot of that 20 years ago. <laughs> anyway, I just want to talk a little bit about consignment sheets, which um, I've used when I take work to a gallery or any entity or someone who's getting involved with artwork. Um, you need to protect yourself. Uh, all that was very well and good, but I doubt that most artists I know get that involved. I make a, I've had to make up my own consignment sheets because I found that when you, a lot of times when you take work to a gallery, they just want to take the work in and they say, okay, see you later. So I make up my own and you just need your name, the list the title of the work, the description of the work, and the retail price. And I usually put down 50-50 split. We're not that sophisticated as uh, the attorney uh, just mentioned to you. Uh, and I get the gallery or the person who's taking the work to sign it, I date it, and I keep the copy for myself. I had a li um, uh, little handwritten one page is fine for me. At least I have something that I can show that I own the work and I brought the work to the gallery or whatever entity it is and they signed for it. And I needed all those when I got involved with, um, um, uh, I better not talk about it. Do it without, <laughs> without, you can do it without naming names. <laughs> yeah, I, I got involved with a uh, uh, lawsuit, and the fact that I have all those consignment sheets is, is, uh, is very good in uh, giving to my attorney, and uh, my attorney can take this to court and show the judge, here is the work. It's been consigned to the gallery, but there is no proof that it ever came back to the artist. Um, a, a little incident that I might tell about uh, consigning work. I lived in Huntington at one time before coming out here to uh, beautiful East End, and I belonged to the Huntington Art League, and it was a very active and prestigious group. And uh, there was a young lady who c called me and said uh, they're having a designer showcase at one of the posh uh, North Shore estates, and would I be willing to donate some work for the show. They were having a gallery presentation, and I would get half the proceeds. So I said, sure, fine, come over. I picked out a few paintings, and she came over. She loved the work. She was ooing and aahing, and she took three, and I had her sign the consignment sheet. And uh, after the show opened, I went down to see the show. No paintings. None. I asked people, where are the paintings? We don't know anything. I thought, I couldn't have sold all three. Very unlikely. So when I, this was before cell phones. So when I got home, I called her and I said, I don't even remember her name. I said, where are my paintings? She said, oh, I know, isn't that awful? I couldn't find them either. <laughs> so I said, really? And she said, no, I'm so sorry, Molly. I'm so sorry. I said, well. You, as you signed a, a consignment sheet and you were acting as my agent, and as my agent, you either owe me the paintings or the full retail price. And she goes, oh. Now it happened that this young lady was married to an attorney. <laughs> so a couple of days later, I get a check in the mail for the full retail price of all three paintings. So. You've got to protect yourself somehow. That may not have been a completely legal uh, piece of paper. Might not have 
protecting me from everything, but it worked. <laughs> You're very lucky. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was so angry that she thought I was that stupid. I, I, I was ready to go small claims court. But anyway, if you don't have that, if you don't, uh, I know an, a, quite a famous artist out here who never got consignment sheets. And I said to him, I think you better. And if you don't have consignment sheets, gather up as many of the show cards that you have where it has your name and the dates and the title of the show that you were in. Uh, show cards, write-ups and papers, um, anything with your name and the name of the show and the gallery, just so that you have some record that you brought this work to the gallery for a particular show. Now, I must say, I've had wonderful, wonderful relationships with 99 and 9 tenths of the galleries I, I exhibited with, but the always a little bad apple in the barrel, and I picked one. <laughs> so, uh, wish me luck. Thank you. To be continued. John. Hi, everyone. Um, I also want to echo with Molly uh, what she said um, about, I wish I had heard this panel discussion about 10 years ago. I have my own experiences with uh, particular dealers, but overall in my art career, I have had great relationships with galleries, dealers, art advisors, anyone that I've worked with over the years, even including fellow artists. Um, but I do want to emphasize the need for a contractual relationship with whomever you're dealing with. Um, Ten years ago, I dealt with someone where I did not have a contractual relationship, and I suffered uh, because of that uh, relationship. But one thing that happened was that I had found out that the dealer had sold one of my pieces because a friend of mine went to her friend's house and the painting was on his wall. <laughs> and she said, is that a John Hawbrick? And he said, yes, it is. I bought it three weeks ago at X Gallery, and I love it. And then my friend called me and said, do you know that X Gallery sold your painting, and I said, no, I have no idea because X Gallery never reached out to me where I picked up the phone and called X and said, how is the work doing? Um, I understand that you sold the piece, and he, this particular gallerist was very flummoxed, but said, oh yes, I have a check for you, come over right now and I'll, I'll give it to you, and I went over, I received two hastily written checks which equaled the amount of the piece, which I immediately went to my bank and deposited <laughs> to make sure. Um, also, I dealt with a, a gallery where they closed. They never informed me they closed. They gave the ownership or the direction of the gallery over to the assistant, who then contacted me to let me know this had happened and that my paintings were in a warehouse, but she had no record of what was there. So that caused me to pull images together, to s email her images, where she then went into the warehouse and found what she could out of quite a large inventory. But I will say, sometimes you have to learn the hard way, and that I never received one piece back. So my assumption is that it was sold. I was never notified, but I don't know that. That being said, as artists, we do have responsibilities. And one of the responsibilities I was thinking about today, not only contracts and uh, representation, how you're properly represented by other people who do want to represent you, but I also wanted to touch upon how artists act and how we ourselves must be ethical beings. And that being said, um, I think as an artist, it's always been important to me that if I have a relationship with a gallery or a dealer or an art advisor, that I don't say to someone who comes to a show, don't buy the painting here. Come see me later, and I'll give you, you know, my friends and family discount. I don't do that. I've heard that said before. I think it does nothing more than damage our reputation as artists if we ex engage in such behavior. Um, um, also, I think it's very important that we keep our pricing consistent. So what our works are selling for in a represented space 
should also be what we are selling our work for to our friends, to our family, and, and, and anyone else who may approach us outside of if that relationship has ended with the gallery, who is, as was mentioned in the previous presentation. So I said, you know, I learned the hard way. So what I do now as an artist, um, and you know what, I've also been on the other side of this where I've done things with artists, and I've been burned by artists also through things that they have done. But that being said, there is a responsibility, and um, what I do now is I keep a record. I have actually what I call um, an online, I call it my art journal. It's an electronic file. And what I do is I list everything that I enter and all the pieces that I enter. And most of the stuff that I do now, a lot of stuff is online. I enter online competitions. I've been really pleased with them uh, because everybody that I've dealt with in online uh, galleries and shipping ga things around the country is that I always get contracts from these people. I always get contracts. I always sign contracts. I always send contracts back. But I do keep really good records now. And I know as an artist, for me, it's hard to do because you know, I'm an artist and so I'm quite disorganized <laughs> at times. But I do keep this art journal. I also keep folders uh, for everybody that's currently representing me with their name on it or else with the gallery's name. And there are JPEGs in each of those folders as to what I've given to those galleries, along with any scans or electronic PDFs or whatever of contracts or agreements I may have received from them. And um, I think that's pretty much it. It's really, I really do believe that it's our responsibility to protect ourselves. I'll just echo that one more time. So thank you. Thank you. So now let's hear from a couple of dealers. <laughs> Arlene, you want to go next? I came out here in the 1960s as a student at the Corcoran School of Art in Washington. Each summer I came to know more and more of the artists, a lot of the old timers who, who uh, have long since left us. And we would have openings at uh, Southampton College where I was taking classes and de Kooning and all these other people would come by. It was just very open and free in those days. Over time, I found my affinity for the art of others uh, overshadowed my own ambitions as an artist. And I was lured away from my teaching job to direct a gallery in Washington. I showed primarily artists from the East End of Long Island many of whom had not shown in Washington heretofore. In fact, when Elaine de Kooning had a solo show, a critic asked her during an interview, uh, had she shown in Washington before? And she said, no. And she said, why not? And she said, nobody ever asked me before. And that was her first solo show in Washington, DC. Uh, in those days, I could go over to James Brooks or to John Little or any number of artists uh, and they'd put the painting in, the, in my car by, no, you need a receipt. No, that's okay, I trust you. Uh, not a good idea. Elaine de Kooning would say, I'll leave the door open, I'll put some of Bill's drawings on the side <laughs> table. And one day I open the door and I get in there, no drawings. So I'm looking around, I thought, oh, she's done it now. Uh, there were some dogs, she had lots of dogs, eight or nine rescue dogs. And I noticed something white under one of the dogs sleeping, <laughs> moved him a little, and there were the drawings. So it worked out just fine, just had a little <laughs> dog hair on them. But over, over 24 years of directing and then subsequently owning my own gallery, I've learned uh, a great deal. And I'm always happy, as some artists know, to share whatever I've learned to make the journey a little easier for artists and dealers uh, of the next generation, the current gen and generation too. It's been a terrific experience working with wonderful artists. And I have to mention, uh, Faye Lansner became a lifelong friend. Faye Lansner, wonderful figurative painter and abstract painter of the New York School 
and had a show recently out here in the Quag Gallery through her daughter, who's here today. And Faye and I were lifelong friends. <clears throat> so this comes out of these kinds of relationships of galleries and artists. It's a unique relationship. It's special. Uh, friendships do grow out of it. However, time and again, as John's pointed out, I observed that many artists really don't look out for themselves. I can't believe when I hear that a gallery takes your work and doesn't give you at least a receipt, walk away. <laughs> don't leave your work with anybody. The same with artist representatives. Make sure they know something about art before you hand over. Uh, very often they ask for a fee up front. I've heard of this kind of thing. Uh, and certainly would advise against it. This naivete all around, I had a lot of it myself starting out. Because again, when I first came here, I would listen to these artists speaking in the 1970s. I didn't know very much myself, and so I listened and I learned a great deal. They would complain about their galleries or they would love their galleries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The artist has all legal ethical rights, as does the gallery, as been, has been mentioned here. But sometimes the lines get blurred and here, communication is so crucial. And again, I'm um, being redundant here. But so many issues, pricing has been mentioned, commissions, insurance, discounts, charities, and, and artists showing at other venues when they're exclusively represented by a gallery. Now again, I see this out the East End as a small town situation. But professional is professional, and it has to rule the day. Uh, A model out here, in my view, a model of representation would be, if it's exclusive, you owe the artist at least every two years a solo exhibition. This is pretty much based on early New York models. Um, artists whose work you put in group shows from time to time, I did a lot of theme shows. So an artist who's doing figurative work would be in a show called Figures Form, or an artist, I did an art of protest, and I would look up artists whose work worked along those lines. Twofold, it broadened the scope of the gallery. It gave um, recognition to artists who <coughs> perhaps could use more. And so it was a good showcase opportunity and also uh, covering numerous topics uh, as approached by different artists. Uh, a couple of things that I've observed along the way, for example, you're, an artist is with a gallery. Can you still hear me back there? Is with a gallery and they really would rather go with another gallery. Tell the gallery, if you have any respect for the gallery with whom you're currently working, tell them that you're speaking with someone else. A good example, uh, years ago when I ran Benton Gallery in Southampton, an artist whose work I did know came in and was interested, wanted to know if I was interested in his work. I said yes. He said his gallery had recommended that he have a broader spectrum in terms of exposition of his work. However, if I did like his work <clears throat> and wanted to show it, he would like first to speak with his current gallery, talk it over with him. I did, he did, we had a solo exhibition, and the former gallery owner came and bought one of his works. Here's where integrity really shines. It's a good, it's a good thing to do. Uh, keep it uh, uh, decent. Uh, another thing too, if you do approach another gallery, and I've seen this happen, don't speak ill of your current or former gallery. Uh, it can come back to bite you. And don't speak ill of their artists. One example, someone came in, actually a number of times, either my niece or I myself or somebody else does the better work than anything you've got here. I said, well, then why would they want to show here? <laughs> <laughs> End of story. <laughs> 
so it's good to know, uh, I think it's uh, Wittgenstein said, if you don't know whereof you speak, one must be silent. Well, there's a case where it might be a good idea. In terms of selling, there are problems with selling from the studio. An artist is told a person bought a painting. The artist invites the person to the studio and secretly, out here is a little more difficult than uh, uh, one might imagine, sells directly, bypassing the gallery and of course the tax. Uh, it happens. Also, a collector will buy a work and then look up the artist and the, the one sentence quoted to me was, oh, we would like to bypass the gallery and the tax. We find ways to work this out so that the painting gets sold. It's a secret. But I have found that it can be amicable, the artist comes out well, uh, but it's too long a story to explain how we did it, but you can make it work. Although in one case, someone went on and on and on about an artist's work, he was desperate for money. They called him, went to his studio, he called and said, what do I do? I said, no problem, just give me, you know, I'll phone them and say, I'm so happy you like his work, and uh, we sold the work. It's quite that simple. Uh, another contemporary issue is charities, donating to charities. Years ago, in a conversation with Jim Brooks at a party, and he said, you know, I often wonder what happens to all the drawings that go to charities. I never hear much about it. And that led me to the idea of advising anyone I represented to request 50% of the price of any contribution to a charity. You can hand that check back to the charity, and then you can write off a cash donation to a charity. But this way, you know what it's sold for, and also, as has been mentioned, in any dealing with a gallery or charity, you should, you have the right to know who purchased the work. Absolutely. Uh, and not just in terms of keeping an archival record, which is, has always been my advice, also, by the way, sign your work, put labels on the back. I get, I get uh, inquiries from people, they'll show me a painting, no name on the front, no name on the back, nothing. I've got to guess and sometimes can figure out who that artist is. But the artist's responsibility is to identify their own work. Uh, and that pretty much, in short, open, honest communication and mutual respect. Uh, with this ruling the day, there would really be no need for litigation among artists and dealers. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So, Gee, I don't know. I come last, and after Arlene, I feel like I have not that much to add. But my takeaway, really, is the idea of best effort. Because is that the term that you use on, on the part of the dealer? I say it's on both parts. Um, and I feel, after having listened to both of you in particular, I feel really pleased. I feel like I have done that. As a, as a dealer, as a gallerist for so many years, because um, I started out very young as well. <laughs> and, um, and, but my background, I think the main thing was my background in museums as, as a, in curatorial and as a registrar also, I feel like that gave me the utmost respect that Really, I mean, I think we all know this, that without the artist, there, there is no business. There is no dealer. There is no gallery. And for, and for me, with the museum background, that was, that was most important to me, is the artist and my respect for that relationship. And it really is all about relationships. Um, so I, you know, I haven't, in the years that I've worked out here, I started a gallery that represented Latin American artists. I did not work with local artists. 
So there was a little bit of a, a trickiness to that in some cases, but really for me it was always transparency, having the forms, uh, coming to an agreement of who ships, who pays for the shipment to the gallery, who pays for the shipment after all of that contained in that consignment agreement, um, the terms of payment, if I sold a work, how much later did I have to declare to the artist, what I sold it for, who it went to. I have always found that was of utmost importance that the artist know who their work went to, what collection they were in. Hands down, I never ever hide that from an artist. And I, I'm, I've been amazed to listen to the stories that you've shared because, and I'm sure you have many more, because I, I for me, the, as I said, the relationship and the best effort of, e of each side, but in my case, as the, as the dealer, has been paramount. Um, and uh, I don't know what else to add. I well, think that we're all... you mentioned to me just a little while oh, ago yes. an issue that you've had with some artists. I was so. just, oh yeah, that you just reminded me because I think also um, this informality of, of uh, I was speaking to Ralph actually earlier and I said, you know, what amazes me, and I think it's because artists are, in a, in a situation where oh, I'm going to get representation and they get so excited and then they just go in head first without getting a receipt, without having a consignment agreement, without having all these formalities taken care of. Um, I've had that experience of people just leaving work with me and I, you know, I want to give them the, the, all the, the proper uh, documents and no, no, it's okay, just take it, just take it, especially in my situation as, as uh, representing Latin American artists where, for instance, I had an artist from Argentina who was showing in a consulate and I met him there and he was just enthralled with the fact that he'd be able to leave work in New York and he said, when this finishes, just take all this work. And I said, oh, okay, all right, well, and you know, we did all the consignment agreements and everything. And then I've had the work for, I think it's like 10 years now. Um, I never, you know, I never really was able to do much with it. I showed it a few times. I would be in communication with him and I said, you know, really, I can't do much. Can I return it to you? No, just keep it, just keep it, just keep it, just keep it. And it's, here I am storing artist's work. And nobody's paying me for the storage. <laughs> so I mentioned it to uh, Carol and I said, so what is the statute of limitations? How much longer do I have to hold on to this and not be able to just sell it and keep all of the income? Or, or, and, or does the artist then have the right to then come back to me and say, well, wait a minute. You know, where, where does that end after the agreement expired? So yes, thank you for reminding me. But I think best efforts on both sides, that for me is the biggest takeaway. I feel like I shouldn't have been on the panel, I should have just been in the no, audience yes, because I think that, no, I think that that for me has been a, a reaffirmation of uh, what I feel very strongly about is that communication and transparency uh, and the relationship between the artist and the representative. So. Cover yourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, maybe next time we need to have a bad dealer on the panel, but I doubt that we can get them. Um, these are amazing, every single one of you. It's just amazing to have you. You want to come up, and you guys can ask questions of the panelists. Yes. No, no, no. I want the I want the panelists to come up. And just make yourselves comfortable and see. Are you Max? <laughs> Do you want to sit? Molly, where would you like? You want to sit? I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm happy to stand. Yeah, you are? I'll stand. Yeah. It's better for my, my back. back hurts. Really oh. Okay. Oh, that feels good. I, I want to just get Max Rand is here, and I I wish we had more time for you, but if we would just speak brief. That, like for a minute about what he's had a lot of uh, uh, work stolen and has made contact with law enforcement people to try to get them aware of the issue so that if there's really something egregious like oh, Molly's nice. situation, a knock on the door from the DA might get the attention of the dealer. So would you just speak sure. very briefly? Very briefly. <laughs> I was a victim of a lot of thefts over a 20 year period, um, up to about 700 pieces. What? The FBI got involved exactly 10 years ago 
two agents came to my apartment or my house in Baiting Hollow, three and a half hour hour interview, and I then started the process, uh, which I there's not enough time to go into, but it involved um, the gentleman, uh, Robert Whitman, who started the FBI's art crime team. Uh, I spent four days with him uh, in Ohio where work was showing up and being monetized. Um, where I'm at now is uh, this year I met with Senator Laval. He was very gracious, gave me 45 minutes of his time, and helped uh, iron out some difficulties I was having with uh, another FBI agent who usually what happens in these cases is that they float from every couple years, they move up the food chain, and uh, it's somebody else's case. And uh, the uh, three favorite words that any criminal likes to hear is statute of limitations. So I've approached Senator Laval on new legislation, and also uh, I've been in contact with uh, Mark Woolley, who's the chief of staff with uh, uh, Congressman Zeldin. Um, you will not find in the Constitution, the Department of Justice, or the FBI. It's something that, uh, that is controlled and uh, has to answer to, uh, to Congress. Uh, of course, he's in the middle of a campaign, which uh, slows, things up, slows things up a little bit. But um, my hope is to um, propose uh, and uh, have uh, some success with uh, better rights for artists, uh, and also to extend the statute of limitations. I'm sure we've all heard of the famous Isabel Stewart Gardner heist. Um, I was fortunate enough to see those paintings, especially the Rembrandt uh, Sea of Galilee. I studied it. Two weeks later, it's gone. It hasn't been seen since. Uh, Senator Kennedy, when he realized Massachusetts, this a statute would run out, uh, extended it. Uh, of course, this was back in the early 90s, and uh, they still have not found those paintings. It, we were all robbed. Um, right now, uh, the issue that I put forth in a Dan's paper article was that uh, art crime is the third biggest crime in this world, throughout the world, and in this country. And uh, in Italy, they have 280 Asians working on art crime. Do you know how many we have in this country? Three. <laughs> we have 16, and half of them are still working on the Isabel Stewart Gardner Heist. So uh, once the stolen art goes over state lines, what's, what, you, what you'll hear is it's out of my jurisdiction. So we need to have a bridge there. And so thank you. I mean, we, thank should you. Have, we should have you talk about this sometime. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to be allowed. This is the first time I've ever publicly spoken no, about it. No, and it's great, it's great to uh, start adding to the rights people have. Yeah. Questions? I have a question about uh, licensing reproductions. If I, I'm a photographer, so it's even more complicated for me, but if as a, a painter, let's say I sell a, a piece of work, who owns the image of that painting? Do I still retain the right to reproduce that image? The artist um, owns the copyright. You're just selling, if an artist sells a work, the artist is simply selling the physical work in which the copyright is embodied. But doesn't that person only has the right to display privately that physical work? The artist retains the copyright. That's great news. No, and we'll, we often do talks just on copyright. We've done a lot of them, so people get the people who come to a lot of these. But it, you can't hear enough, so we'll, we'll, we'll you do, do it more again. of that. Yeah. No question. Okay, yes. So you, you said um, a gallery should provide the names of the buyers to the artist, but is that not, I, I thought that that was actually a part of the new NICAL law, that it was required. Not that I know of. I don't think so. Names. No? Mm -hmm. No. Hmm. Okay. I, I, I'm curious, let's say you have all these contracts, paper, writing, and they're stolen. What, that your, your, your contract with, yes. with, with, with the, that your contract with the dealer is stolen? So your archives were tampered with, you're missing all your documents. You know, you just have to think about protecting yourself. I mean, if anything's stolen, give, make multiple copies, uh, you know. Exactly. And, and, in, and in a lawsuit, it's also testimony. A court can see if they believe you and, you know. Right, right. But I would always make extra copies of valuable contracts and, and, and put them in different places, including a vault. Okay. That's a good idea. Kathy, do you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to hear again how much uh, art, art crime there was. Could you repeat what you said before? For you. Yeah. 
how much art crime? Yeah. You see, you gave According to the FBI, uh, art crime is the third biggest crime in this country, uh, followed close behind art or uh, uh, drugs and uh, guns. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Uh, right now, I have 200 pieces listed with the national uh, stolen art file, and that's the only thing we have, uh, and it's it's doubling probably every two every two and three months. Uh, the people I was working with have, all, have moved on to other offices. This is another big problem with the federal government. Who you're talking to one month, you're talking to somebody different, and you're having to play the whole scenario out again. And I'm sure we've all been through this uh, one way or another. If you've been, uh, uh, contacted or had any business with that. Yeah. I mean, just something else that was said about uh, some, somebody said sign the painting. If you're an artist, learn about copyright and register your copyright. Because if somebody takes your work and uses it, uh, you really can't sue them without registering. It's a kind of ridiculous requirement, but it's a requirement. So it's something really worthwhile doing. I just have one other question. What I have found out is a, a scam where they trim art, a name of a lesser known artist, and a good forger will come and put your name. That's a violation of the Visual Artists' Rights Act, which is a federal statute, um, which forbids any tampering of a work by an artist. In, and um, it's uh, a violation of the integrity right, and a viola it's, a, it's part of the copyright law, the federal copyright law. And it's called the Visual Artist Rights Act. And it's two rights, the right of paternity and the right of integrity. And your scenario, it was enacted um, effective June 1st, 1991. So let's say this is discovered years after the fact. You find a painting that's yours. Somebody trimmed the name off. They signed a better known artist's name on it. Because it looks similar, they run it through a shotgun auction, you know, works its way through the food chain. How many years do you have? I, I, I we have to look we'd have to look up the it's statute of limitations. The life of the artist, if, if it's, if it it's lasts, in the, the copyright law, the copyright lasts your life plus 70. We'll look it up and see how long. It's in the law. I'll send, you're, remind you're, me, I'll send you the site and you can look at the law yourself. But it's it's an important one to know. Can I take that? Of course. On my paintings, what I do now for many years is I sign, I don't sign the front, I sign the, um, what do you call it? The edge of it, the edge of the painting. Then I sign at the bottom on the back, my name and date. So if they try, if they try to cut off, they'd be cutting off a lot of the painting. <laughs> That's interesting. Good idea. Yeah. Right in the yeah. And and that 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 is there forever. That's a very good idea. That's that signature. Good idea. It's a very good idea, but with nowadays with newer digital formats, yeah. you, you know, n this is not applicable necessarily. I mean, what does an artist with a DVD of a video that he or she made, you know, it, all of that becomes yes. much, much more, more complex. difficult. Yeah, Absolutely. that's why it's important to know about copyright and register your copyright. Yeah. Yeah. When, you, when you find out copyright infringement, does the clock start ticking at discovery? As far as the st as far as statute of limitations, I believe People it's I believe it starts at the time of the infringement, but don't hold me to that. Three years, but, yeah. And there, the sometimes the lawyers argue forever about when it starts. So, well, but you have like, like say with registration, you have to register either before it's infringed or within three months of getting the work out there. So that's that's one of the most meaningful things that you could do if, in the event, not of necessarily stealing, but if somebody's going to use it for something else. So also, it's important to protect yourself with regard to social media. When you put something up on Instagram, for example, the bylaws of, in of Instagram, yes, that's yes. A very good uh, you're giving them permission to do whatever they want. No, not whatever they want, but Pretty what I always say, read the terms of service, because all the, so they, they all have to have permission to, 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 to use your work. They have to have your permission to reproduce your work and to distribute it. Right. But they don't have to have permission to do whatever they want with it. Except then there is this artist, I can't recall his name, he's at the Southampton Art Center right now, and he's the one who downloaded all of the work, uh, was uh, created by other artists, and then he blew them all up and put them in Gagosi and Gallery. Well, that could be fair use, so you and need to come to, we, we don't have time to That's take, a subject of a different print. print. But, the, but the point is, is to be aware of Yeah, the and learn your are. rights, because that's, right. You know, he does that all the time. That's what he does. He's not just a, I don't know who, if it's 
who it is, but I can imagine. I think you know who it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all know yeah, yeah. Who, it, who is it? I can't remember. It's, well, Richard Prince says it all the time, but I doubt Richard Prince is showing the Southampton no, Art Center. Yeah. <laughs> no, Peter Marino has it. No, it's not Peter Marino. at the center. But there's some things that artists can do with your copyrighted work, and there's some things you can do with other people's copyrighted work. It's important to know that. Yes? Question about uh, <laughs> the artist wants to donate a work of art to a museum um, and does so. Uh, I have a question about, um, you know, has the law changed in any way to benefit an artist in terms of, of tax deductions? No. We're going to ask the, Ralph, that, so the was, expert I, in the back as well. You, you I answered it. <laughs> no, it has not. <clears throat> in, in order to donate and, and get a, a tax deduction for the fair market value, it has to be a long-term capital gain type asset. It cannot, it, it, it cannot be inventory. It cannot be a work that the artist has created. Um, it has to fit the related use rule, meaning it has to be related to the exempt purpose. But to answer your question shortly, the law has not changed and the artist cannot get a tax deduction. And why, not, why don't artists think about getting involved in some of these political issues that would help them? And they're not good at it, and I understand it, but there are there are issues that could help them, and most people aren't going to fight for artists except for artists. So that's something to think about. Yes. And has the resale um, uh, act, which was F, which was written in California specifically, has that been changed or updated in any way? It's been proposed um, from New York, whatever. Proposed. It's been proposed, and it's it's not been enacted. It's another example of something, if artists get involved, tell your representative you want it passed because galleries and auction houses don't want it. If you, if you think it's important, and I know it'll be important for you, you've got you to gotta find a way to get it, it's, it's It's been shot down, the and it, it's, the court shot it, it down because they found that it was unconstitutional. It was in violation of the Commerce Clause of the Eighth Amendment. So I don't see this happening. Well, it, it's got shut down in California, but if a federal law is passed that takes in, that into account, you could have one, but you've got to, you know, that's got to have a lot of support. But I don't see that happening in this administration, and I don't think you do either. I mean, no, I don't see it. It's not going to happen. And for it to happen, there has to be a lot of interest. And yeah, I mean, that doesn't mean it would happen. happen in this administration, for it no. ever to happen. Because yeah. the Visual Artist Rights Act, which we talked about, happened actually because an artist, Rauschenberg got very involved, or Kennedy got involved, he's not an artist, but that's not something that a lot of, uh, a lot of people in the high end of the auction, of the art world necessarily were interested in, it helps, it helps artists. But there was a lot of lobbying, the film industry kept themselves out of it, it's a very narrow, it's narrowly applied, but. It was very grudgingly applied, in order for right. us to be badly compliance. applied. Yeah. Right. Yes. If one buys a work of art for price X and sells it for an exorbitantly higher rate than that, is the artist to do any portion of that exorbitantly higher rate? No. Negative. No. That's what we're talking about, because there's been a proposal. Rauschenberg got involved in this a long time ago in trying to get a bill passed, which he, they did pass one. There were a lot of problems with it, but a lot of artists are interested in that happening and it has not passed. That's exactly what yes. Walter's talking are, about. Are there jurisdictions where it doesn't? In Europe, no, it happens. Not in the United States. Yeah. What's the proper title? What do they call that? Resale, Resale royalty rights. Yeah. And there's a French word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a sweet right. Yes. So. Well, if, if those are all the questions, then I would just like to say thank you all for coming. Tell your friends. These workshops that have been offered by the East Hampton Arts Council are so important. And many artists think that they don't need to bother their little heads about business. <laughs> and I have to tell you, we, we work with a lot of writers here in the library. And we are pushing them. Um, we have workshops where we have literary agents come. We have workshops where we have publishers come. Writers and artists and all creative people must take themselves seriously, and they must understand that they are also business people. 
and if you're not up to being a business person, then you need to find someone to represent you. You need an agent. Um, you need somebody to help you get through this because otherwise you're going to keep being on the short end of the stick. And you need to be involved with the political aspect. Max, should everybody write to Senator Laval and, and voice their, their when, when needs? I, when I had the meeting with Mark Woolley at his office in Riverhead and uh, the almost seconds after I wrapped up the pitch, he said, what's the consensus? And I knew exactly what he meant. And I told him, your constituency, there's a large part of artists out here on the East End. So he's, they're already feeling out the consensus being how many people are behind this. Mm -hmm. Before he puts his, you know, time, effort, and money, resources, you know, because all politicians, you know, they're thinking the next two years down the line. And if people would like to contact me, I'll leave a few cards out. Uh, Joy O'Shaughnessy here, who works at East End Disability, been a great help with the administrative aspects of helping push this through. I, again, Senator Laval is only good for New York State, and fortunately, New York State has some really good lawyers. That's a great start, though. New York is where is the art world. But as soon as the art world goes to New Jersey, you're screwed. Well, but that's a good start. And I always say this to art, I mean, that when artists care about something, there's a loft law in the city that allows certain artists, and I'm sure you all know them, to live in very big spaces at rent-stabilized rates. And that law sunsets. Whenever it sunsets, which means it's going to disappear, the artists come out and they support it and it's extended. And artists have to do that. Absolutely and, right. And I have to tell you, speaking about Ken Lebeau, he is a great library supporter. Libraries every year in March go up, and we tell him how important it is and how much we appreciate his support. We never actually meet with Ken, we always meet with one of his staff. But I, yeah, I can't tell you when we go up as libraries, Albany is packed with teachers. Packed, they come by the busloads. Stand up for yourselves, do it. You have to do it. So Max, if you want to share some of that information, who they need to write to, who they need to call, who they need to email, you have to do it for yourselves. Yeah, you I do. I, I concur. Uh, the, more, the bigger the numbers, the more they're going to pay attention. And with the voting now being so narrow with who gets in and who doesn't, uh, they count. Yeah. Anyway, I thank you all. I thank these amazing speakers for coming together. Thank you. Thank you.